our panel here. My name is Peter Spiegel. I am the U.S. Managing Editor of the Financial Times, and this is the third time I have chaired the European Security um, Panel here at the, at the Aspen uh, Security Forum, because I always put my hand up for it, um, for two reasons. First of all, um, Aspen always seems to manage to get a panel full of stars that I get to, to uh, sit next to. But at least since February 24th of last year, there's another reason, obviously, um, that I like to chair the European panel. I think sometimes here in the United States, um, when we talk about Ukraine, when we talk about Russia, it is very easy for us, an ocean away, um, to be armchair generals. Um, for Mercia, his home country, Romania, borders Ukraine. Um, for the Brits and the Dutch here, it's not much further away either. And I think getting the view of Europe on the war is essential for us um, because it, it, living the war much more closely than we are. Um, you have met Mercia already. Um, I'll go uh, from left to right here just to, to introduce you to the other two. Uh, Jeffrey van Leuven. My, my, my Dutch is brilliant, having spent six years in, in, in Belgium. Um, he is basically the Jake Sullivan of the Dutch government, um, the outgoing Dutch government, I must say. Um, he is uh, the Prime Minister's uh, security and foreign policy advisor, but has a long, distinguished career. And I think, looking at your bio, it's every hotspot that the Dutch government need to send you, particularly long time in Afghanistan and Pakistan. All, all successful. Uh, all successful, that's a very good point. Um, sitting next to him from, from the UK is Tom Tugendhat. Um, his title is Minister for Security, but I think that title sort of underplays the role he has played in the conversation within Parliament and within the UK more broadly on security issues. He's a former soldier in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, has a long experience in, in the region, and I was hoping it was going to happen today, but maybe in the next 24, 48 hours, the great mentioners of the sky have mentioned Tom as potential next defense secretary. And um, that's the end of that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the, the FT endorsement has uh, sunk his candidacy. Um, Jeffrey, let me, let me start with you, and I want to pick up where, where David uh, was just, uh, talking to, to Mercia, um, because I think, and it's unfair to put this to the Dutch, to be honest with you, and, and even to the Brits, but I think there is a, because you guys both have been uh, the very forward-leaning, shall we say, when it comes to advocating for F-16s in your case, main battle tanks in the case uh, for the Brits, for weaponry for the Ukrainians. There, I think there still is a perception, however, in the U.S., and, and Colin Call mentioned $43 billion Americans have spent, that although there have been commitments and, and rhetoric, that the Americans are still the ones um, putting, paying most of the bill. Let me ask you, is that a fair criticism? And is there things that, as a European pillar within NATO or even the EU, that um, the Europeans can do more uh, to make that, that, that gap less? Yeah. Well, let me first say that I think the, the Russian invasion um, in, in Ukraine is really a turning point in our European history. And it's a big wake-up call for our populations. Um, the, the idea that we could lean backwards and, 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 and to rely on you guys to, to pay for security, that's completely gone. And if you see the, the speed of spending on defense uh, all over Europe, especially in my country as well, uh, we're uh, reaching 2% next year, it's, it's 20 billion a year. Um, uh, it's double from, from a couple of years ago. Um, we also have this false, this, this, this sense of necessity that we have to draw the line here. We accept it. 2014, we accepted the downing of this MH17, uh, but this is really for the Dutch population, but especially also for the Brits, but many European countries, we had to draw the line. Uh, it is a sense of values in terms of you cannot evade another country and our whole international based system will be broken down and others are watching how we will react. But the second is security. Uh, it, it's far, far away from here. It's very close to our sense. And if Putin will not be stopped, it would not have been stopped what would it be next? So I think it's really a turning point in terms of uh, spending. Um, the Brits have been great in Europe. I think the leader, uh, again, in Europe in terms of resolve, in terms of spending. Uh, but we're number five, uh, not in percentage of GDP, but in, in actual numbers. So it's the US in real numbers, number one. It's two, it's the UK. Three is Japan, four is Germany, and five is the Netherlands. So for us, it's a wake-up call. Uh, and we heard the poll, and, and we are, we're doing, actually doing uh, quite a lot. And if you look at all over Europe combined, uh, we're reaching 40 billion this year. So that's equivalent to what the, what the Americans are doing. Let me ask you, just as a follow-up to that, the EU itself as an institution, um, because you, the Dutch are, are obviously both a founding member of both NATO and the EU, have, much to my surprise, to be honest with you, having lived in Brussels for six years and covered the EU, kind of got its security act in order to a certain extent and has developed a fund that e the EU itself as an institution will be funding weaponry um, and, and uh, armaments for the Ukrainians. Talk to me a little bit about that and the EU emerging as a force 
in the, the security space and not just say aid in trade as their two tools for foreign policy? Yeah. Well, I, I think there, I think also to the surprise of Putin and to many others to resolve the European Union to say this is enough and we're going to strike back, especially on sanctions in the beginning phase of the war has been exemplary and we pulled together and we see and we understand the necessity of Europe beyond trade uh, and aid, but also military terms. Having said that, for us in the Netherlands, as a staunchly transatlantic country, we see, and I think it's, it's confirmed again by what has happened last year, the NATO is our cornerstone to our security. So yes, we will build a stronger uh, defense forces in Europe, but all towards a stronger alliance, a stronger NATO. Tom, let me turn to you and, and ask the slightly awkward question uh, about the EU, which is, um, you may not realize this, you're no longer in it anymore. Um, and I bring this up because I had a conversation with a very senior EU official who came through New York uh, not too long ago, and I said, isn't it a shame that just at a time when the EU gets its act together on, on foreign defense policy, that one of, if not the most capable militaries in Europe is not participating in this? And I got a very, um, I thought, odd pushback, which is we would never have been able to do this if the Brits were in the House. Um, talk to me a little bit about Britain's role in European security if the EU manages to get its act together on foreign security uh, issues when you guys are on the out? The UK, over the last, well, I was going to say two or three years, but let's be honest, over the last 80 years, has been one of the principal security providers to Europe. The only one that has matched it consistently is the United States. And the reality is the UK's role, whichever prime minister, whichever party has been in power, has been absolutely consistent. But frankly, in the last two years, you've seen that even greater. You know, when Rishi Sunak took over as chancellor, he increased defense spending. When Ben Wallace was alone, practically, in Europe to get those last in-laws into Kiev, it was really that that held off Russia's first thrust and allowed the Ukrainians to regroup and push back. So the idea that the UK isn't part of European security, I'm afraid is simply false. Mm. The UK is, remains, and always will be a European power with a major security contribution. And I'm skipping very lightly over the intelligence contribution that we also make. Now, it's certainly true that other countries, France in particular, have made some very significant intelligence contributions uh, in recent months and years uh, from Europe. But the UK remains the principal intelligence and security provider to Europe, from Europe. That is not to be overlooked, and while it's certainly true that our cooperation with the European Union has changed from a member to a partner, uh, the reality is that uh, what Rishi Sunak has done as Prime Minister is reset that relationship to one where we're working extremely well together. You, you mentioned the intelligence uh, bit of it, and, and I guess as an alliance, there are certain countries that are good at this, we won't name and, and, and shame, but. Uh, the UK is one of them, the US is one of them, France is one of them, you mentioned a few of them. NATO as a whole may have gaps, and I know you've spoken out about this uh, quite a bit. Can you talk a little bit about where you think NATO should go? What are we talking about? Did the issue of intelligence gathering and sharing? Sure, look, if you look at uh, how we're being threatened today, NATO has been a brilliant military partnership. There's no question about it, it's been essential to our common defense. But there are countries like Russia, China, Iran that are now using the tactics of criminals and terrorists to challenge us. We've seen uh, human trafficking being used as a form of destabilization. We've seen uh, drugs being trafficked in order to harm different powers. We've seen a whole series of different criminal actions being used by hostile states and indeed non-state actors. And getting NATO together to share that intelligence in new and different ways and making sure we have the intelligence cooperation that goes beyond the military uh, into areas of crime, into areas of uh, terrorism is extremely important for how we shape ourselves into the future. And that's something that the Prime Minister has asked me to work on and that we're doing a lot of work on. I know that many others uh, around the European Union and indeed others outside the European Union, but in our neighboring areas, have been extremely uh, active in making sure that we're able to cooperate. Jeffrey, can I put you on the spot on this one as well? Because the, the Dutch are in a unique situation here in that it is, in many ways, one of the most, or if not the most, transatlantic Atlanticist nation on the continent. Uh, that's for sure. Um, we, we may not remember that there was a Secretary General before Stoltenberg. It's gone on for a long time. Um, he was Dutch. Um, you also are, however, a founding member of the EU. And trying to square that circle, I, I, maybe I'm making too much of this, but it is just striking to me, again, 
if the EU is going to play an increasing role in defense and security issues, how does that work alongside your Atlanticist tendencies to have the Americans and the Brits and others in, in the House as well? Well, first of all, we don't see the conflict. Mm -hmm. and, and let me also concur with my uh, British uh, friend. Uh, when we talk about European security and European partners, it's also the UK. It's not EU uh, when we talk about European security. No, we don't see it as a conflict. Um, we do see NATO as the cornerstone of our collective security. We do see the need as Europe to step up. Uh, and we are, I think, stepping up at this moment. It means investing. I think it's number one, it's investment, investment, investment. It's, it's basically having more budget to spend. Um, but it also means, and a lot of that investment and, 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 and defense orders are, are, are coming to the US, uh, and I think that solidifies our transatlantic relationship. But it also means working together with, with European partners, and we are doing so uh, with the French uh, on helicopters recently, but also with Germany, we're integrating our armed forces. Um, with the, with the, the Belgium uh, and German navies reordering frigates and minesweepers together. So we're, we're setting tremendous steps on the European front, um, but only to strengthen basically NATO, to make sure that collectively as Europe we, we're stronger, but, but so we don't see the problem, we don't see the, the conflict. Mercia, let me turn to you and ask a slightly different question, because we're supposed to be talking about the, the post, it, there will be a war, the war will end. I know sometimes it, it, is, it doesn't seem like war, but all wars come to an end. And Ukraine Putin, will win. According to Tom, Ukraine will win. Um, like all men, um, Vladimir Putin will, will, will disappear from the scene. Um, and so talking about what the post-war architecture, security architecture um, of Europe will look like, you and, you and David talked about the NATO end of things. Ukraine also wants to join the EU. Um, you, as, not only uh, when you were a younger man, worked to, for, for NATO accession for Romania. You also worked for EU accession for Romania. So can I ask you to just put your Romanian hat on and, 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 and think about this? I, I emailed um, an old source of mine uh, in Brussels uh, saying I was going to, to work on this panel. What should I raise? And he said, the most difficult thing we are dealing with now is the issue of Ukrainian membership. And I just want to read what he, what he sent to me. Um, the very success of the EU, that which makes others want to become part of it, is what will pull us apart if you can, Ukraine is brought in. His argument being, you will have a member of the EU that is at war with Russia, has a, a military, even if the war is over, has a military that is clearly ready for a fight with Russia. It's a country of 40 million people. All the, now countries like Romania, which gets net uh, benefits from the EU, EU, will have to be net payers into Ukraine. How do you see Ukraine joining the EU, given Zelensky's passionate plea to join? I have a fundamental belief that all nations on my continent in Europe that desire democratically, freely to join the West and are ready to join the West, they will be joining our family, NATO, EU, or a combination of both. I have absolutely no doubt, historically, strategically, philosophically, and personally, I know that Ukraine will be with us. I know the Republic of Moldova will be with us. They are neutral constitutionally, so this is EU. I know that Georgia, an exceptionally relevant strategic country across the Black Sea towards the Caucasus and Central Asia, in the end, will be with us. Because this is also what NATO and EU, this is all about. The choice of free nations on our continent to be able to, to, choose, to choose their destiny. So I'm not that much <laughs> concerned about the arrival of Ukraine in terms of, of uh, you know, net payers. I think Chancellor Schultz, had a quite interesting remark, I think a few months back, uh, way uh, after the Zeitenwende uh, major speech. Uh, he made a quite interesting remark that after this war, the center of gravity in Europe is moving eastwards. And I think he's right. And I believe this is good. And I believe this is uh, something that will have to, 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 to rearrange, in a way, political, economic, technological, military power, this will be more evenly distributed across, across uh, our continent. The other thing that I would also mention, uh, President Macron had a very interesting remark in Chisinau when there was a, a summit of the European political community. And he said something quite interesting, and that resonates, it's music to my ears, that the difference between the founding older members of the club of the clubs, and the new ones starts to be less distinguishable. So the new ones are learning the ropes. 
the new ones are becoming stronger with one condition. And this is true for my country, this is true for Ukraine, this is true for Moldova, anyone else. If we continue to transform from within, more transparency, real democracy, rule of law, and really putting our potential to work. So I, I'm absolutely convinced, absolutely convinced, as being an eyewitness to transformation of my continent since, since I was much younger and a younger ambassador to Washington, I know that we have Ukraine, I know we have Moldova, I know we have Georgia, and I know every country that wishes and, and is prepared to join us, they should be with us. Just a small, a small footnote about numbers. Last year, European allies and Canada have increased their defense spending before Vilnius, the decisions, by 8.3% of their GDP. Up to 2030, European allies will be purchasing 600 F-35s. NATO EU, with the arrival of Sweden and Finland, and I'm so happy that these two great democracies, great nations are also with us in NATO, 96% of the population of EU member states will be also NATO populations. So we have only one thing, and I'm happy that I have my British and, and, and Dutch allies here, but this is true for our French allies, true for everyone else. I also do not see an inherent tension between the EU becoming stronger in defense and NATO continuing to be even much stronger on defense. We need each other, we are two sides of the same coin, and also, to, if you look to the competition also with China and the others, we'll need everyone. And this is why I'm so happy to see our alliance moving forward. I'm so happy to see our European Union move, moving forward. And also, it's not only the UK uh, here. It's also uh, Turkey. It's also Norway. There are other. Let me give you an example of a contribution. Uh, and I'm asked by US Congress and members of Congress why we are not spending as much as the US. If you put military help for Ukraine, economic support for Ukraine, macroeconomic support for Ukraine, humanitarian for refugees, and having Ukrainian kids, you know, learn in our schools all over Europe, there's also a cost. So I would say that, of course, the U.S. continues to be the number one military provider because of the size of the country, but I would say that the others are also trying to also cover their part of the deal. Iceland doesn't have an army, and they are contributing with C-130s or whatever they have for transportation uh, for help for Ukraine. Merci so I think, I think we are doing pretty much okay. We should do much better. But I think we're not that bad as some people try to describe. Can I just challenge you a little bit on the, the first bit of your remarks, this, the music to your ears? Because um, it, it, it's slightly surprising to be honest with you to hear you say that. Again, my, I, was, I was in Brussels for the original Ukraine crisis, 2014. Um, and the Balts, the Central and Eastern Europeans, the Brits to a certain extent, pounding the table, we, see, we told you so, we told you so, and yet there was a huge percentage, not a huge percentage, a large percentage of member states, um, I maybe should name and shame, but I won't mention any countries that are here right now, let's say the Italians being one of them, um, who wanted to go back doing business with, with the Russians very quickly. And the Poles and the Balts were furious about this. Um, you're saying now that you think the whole of, of, of Europe is singing in one songbook as, as, as Europe moves east. Can I just push you, do you really believe that? Because I do think there are still countries out there um, who roll their eyes at the Bolts and the Poles when they are banging the table about the Russians. Um, just wanted to, to, to push you a bit on that. Yeah, um, I think the allies from the East were right in saying that Russia is a dangerous uh, player. But I'm not in the business here, and not even without my official position, to criticize also the other allies in Europe because geography matters. Not everybody is a neighbor to, to, to Russia. They, they, uh, our allies from the south, from the Mediterranean, Spain, Italy, and the others, they are concerned, as we are in NATO, about the risk of terrorism, of instability, fragility, into an arc of instability from the Gulf of Guinea all the way to Afghanistan. So not every nation has the an identical strategic culture deriving from its history and geography, number one. The second, the second thing I believe what really happened, and I would like to thank our US, UK, and other allies, because there was a lesson learned from 2014. I understand from my colleagues that were in, in the organization in NATO in 2014 that it took a few weeks for all allies to recognize that the little green men were in fact Russian disguised guys. 
And what the US and the UK and others have done prior to the invasion, like never before, is information intelligence sharing with allies at a volume and a level of intimacy like never, ever before. Avril Haines was in Brussels more often than she was in her office here in Washington. Director Burns and the others, UK. And I think the fact that we are able to go to a level of, of sharing of real, sensitive information kept this alliance very much together. Also, speaking of the ones who are doing business with Russia, because mercantilistic interests do exist. I have to say that they've done exceptionally quick and fast Germany, disentangled from the Russian gas and the others. It was costly. And speaking also in terms of burden sharing, I think now, I think 40% of gas in Europe comes from US LNG, which is also good for business. So, uh, yeah, I think we learned the lessons, and I'm quite confident that these lessons will stay with us. I, I hope you're time. right. I hope you're right. Tom, let me turn to you and, and, and go back to something I said at the start, which is, and you added to my, my comments, that this war will end, and let's, let's, let's hope that Ukraine is, is the victor. And let's go to that scenario. Let's go, I think, in, in the way you, your remarks, um, you're looking at a, an expanded NATO with Ukraine as a member. Um, a defeated Russia, perhaps a Putinless Russia. Um, what does what, Russia does not then disappear? It still exists on the periphery of Europe. How does the European security architecture re welcome Russia back into the family of nations? We tried this once after '89. Um, someone mentioned the NATO Russia Council. I had to attend those. Th I had to cover those things on multiple occasions. Um, it was very clear. No one took this seriously. And um, uh, there was a lot of rolling of the eyes about NATO still is about keeping the Americans in, the Germans down, and the, and the Russians out. What should a post-war Russia's role or relationship with Europe look like if we get to the, the best case scenario? Well, Russia's got two choices fundamentally. It can either be a partner with Europe or a vassal of China. We'd all like it to be a partner of Europe. But that means changing some things inside and some things outside. Outside, it means ending the occupation of Georgia. It means ending the occupation of Ukraine. It means releasing people like Evan Gershevich uh, and, uh, and uh, Alexei Navalny. It means actually changing uh, the political dynamic inside. But those things are doable in a Russia that isn't run by a mafia gang calling itself a government. Those things are possible in a Russia that actually has business relations with the West that are not simply based on arms sales and energy. Mm. Now, all of those things are possible. And again, I know you're right, this isn't the first time, but again, the UK and I'm sure the European Union, though I can't speak for them, of course, hold out a hand of friendship and would very much welcome uh, a relationship with Russia that sees it as a, a fair partner. Let me challenge something you said. I mean, the, the, the two things that which are clear, I think everyone has agreed with, is obviously Russia out of Ukraine is a condition. Russia out of other places, don't do it again. The other thing you mentioned, though, was an internal reform, uh, freeing Evan, uh, other things internally. Is that not a bit naive? Is it not what we learned from, frankly, from the Prigozhin is the next leader could be more Prigozhin than Navalny. And if it is a Prigozhin figure, as long as they get out of Ukraine and promise not to do anything like that again, is that good enough to return to the top table? Because that is what we did in the Soviet period. We, it was a regime that we detested, and yet we did welcome them back to the top table, had summits with them in various places. Is it good enough to just do the first two and not the third? Well, I mean, in the Soviet period, we didn't have much to do with them either. I mean, we, we did the top table negotiations, that's true, but the only trade was energy. Mm. There was pretty much nothing else. Uh, if we want, uh, and I think we do want, Russia to be a European partner and not a Chinese vassal, then what we want is we want a, uh, a, a Moscow and a Petersburg that looks west, not east. And I think those things are entirely possible. You just have to meet Russians, okay, admittedly more in Istanbul and, uh, and Dubai than in Moscow these days. Uh, some of us are sanctioned. Um, you know, and you, you meet people who really do look to the west. You see young people in Russia studying in Berlin, in Paris, in London, uh, not so many studying in Beijing. Jeffrey, let me ask you the same question, but a slightly different way, which is um, the EU now is debating the issue of whether to take Russians' seized assets, and, and including sovereign assets, to, and use them for the rebuilding. Um, one of the countries that has been uh, objecting to this has been Germany. Um, I'm not sure they've articulated this way, but I think we'll all remember that in 1919, Germany had a very bad experience in which a defeated country decided, was forced to pay reparations to those who were the victors. Uh, do we not risk repeating that error 
in, again, if I may, may if I use a scenario where best case scenario, Ukraine wins in NATO, Russia defeated, don't we have to find ways to bring Russia back to the family nation and isn't forcing reparations on Russia the mistake we made in 1919? Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult, difficult one. We're not in principle against uh, seizing the, the, well, we seized already assets, but using it for Ukraine, but it has to be done in a legal, and I think that's the German's objection as well, it has to be in a legal sound matter to hold up in the courts. Uh, so we're, we're not that, that far that we can say we can, we can do this. Uh, yeah, I think that's also for, for longer term. Uh, and on, on the short, medium term, uh, it is making sure Ukraine can push them back, and that's all our focus is on. So we're not ready yet. To, to take those assets uh, and, and, and give that to, to Ukraine. Can I ask you just the same thing I asked Tom, which is, if the, if the scenario Tom put, and I'm putting slightly words in your, in your word mouth, so I, I apologize, but the, 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 three, the three things that are, are required to, to rejoin the family nations, one, out of Ukraine, two, don't do it again, get out of the region, three, some kind of internal reform, so we see them joining with our values and stuff like that. Do you think all three are necessary? Because again, in the Soviet period, we had a very peaceful coexistence with a lot of danger, but there was peaceful coexistence without number three. And the likelihood of number three happening, I think, is far less likely than one and two. Or would you accept a, a Russia with a Prigozhin type of leader in, in Moscow, as long as they got out of Ukraine and promised not to, and got out of the other bits of the world where they're making problems? Yeah, but probably we have to judge them by behavior, don't have much, much choice. Um, but I don't think particularly we're going to be eager to return to normalcy with Russia. I mean, look at all our business investments being wiped out. I think there's very little interest to return to Russia uh, in that sense. Uh, so I think we'll just take it as it comes. Uh, I, I, I think it will, will take some time to see what their actions are. But I don't think we're defining exact criteria to, to what extent we're going to talk to them. Fair enough. Fair enough. I, I'm getting two different numbers about how much time is left, so I'm going to go with the one that's, as, as, that's the longest, uh, as, as someone else did. Um, let me change the topic entirely. Um, um, we are, after all, in Aspen. We are in the United States. Um, and we have, in many ways, a reinvigorated NATO with, again, to, to quote um, the first Secretary General of NATO, the Americans in, um, robustly. Okay, I'm getting a, this might be the last question then. Um, <laughs> however, it was not so long ago, there was a President of the United States, who shall we say was not so enthusiastic about the transatlantic relationship. As a matter of fact, threatened to pull out, uh, and, and there is a non-zero chance that that man could be returning um, to the White House. Is the US still a reliable ally to the Europeans in NATO? Jeffrey, let me ask you to start with that and, and go down the line. Okay, well, absolutely, yes. I mean, for us, it's, it's, it's the strategic most important ally that we have. We have. Uh, not just on security, but also on trade investment. The U.S. is our number one investor in the Netherlands. We're the number two investor in the United States. There are one million American jobs because of Dutch investment. Uh, we, 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 we got along quite well with the previous uh, president. My prime minister always said, we understand what he's saying. We understand that, that you're upset by the fact that we, as Europe, collectively, are not doing enough on defense. So we got those messages. We're doing something about it. So we're, we're quite happy to deal with any president uh, uh, you would elect in the future. We're very pragmatic, uh, and, but uh, as a key ally, uh, it is the most crucial uh, ally to us. Tom, same question, obviously given a little bit more weight, given the, the special relationship. It, you know, this was, this was not a president who treated the special relationship particularly well. Um, are you at all concerned that, uh, that a return of a Trump administration would, would see the, the, uh, the, the unity of the alliance that we've now seen fray? Well, to misquote uh, a former president of yours, well, the Dutch may be number two, we were number one <laughs> in terms of investment. <laughs> Uh, and it's, uh, you know, this is a very deep alliance. I see in the audience General John Allen. I served under his command in Afghanistan, and I have served alongside um, many U.S. officers, some of whom have now made it to three and four. So it's amazing. Generals are getting younger these days. <laughs> and it's, um, this is not just a deal. It's not a, it, it, it's, it's not a treaty that is exchanged. The reality is that the relationship that we have, certainly in terms of security, but in many other areas as well, is absolutely fundamental to who we are. And the exchange of personnel between our forces, our intelligence, uh, information, and so on, is so much deeper than anything that happens between Number 10 and the White House that I'm not genuinely concerned. And that's not to say that good relationships can't advance things. Of course they can. But the reality is that the relationship between our two nations is so deep that it's not something that a four-year or even an eight-year term will change. Marcia, let me have you be the last person to address this, but ask you the question in a slightly different way, which is, um, within a, both an EU and NATO context, 
some of the reaction to the Trump administration was, holy cow, we need to take our own defense much more seriously. We have relied on the American umbrella for too long. So there was a bit of a salutary effect in that actually we have to get our own house in order. Has, is, that, is that still, you think, the case? And does the prospect of a Trump administration light a fire under the Europeans to be more serious about how they think about their own security and defense? Listen, we work uh, with both sides of the aisle uh, on, on the Hill. I'm seeing the numbers in the American public opinion supporting NATO, 67, 68%, so rock solid. What I, what I know, that in the arch competition with China, and whoever else China will be attracting in its orbit, America needs all its allies, not only in Europe, but around the world. This is a formidable competition. And for the first time, probably for us Europeans in five centuries, for Americans since the inception or America becoming a global superpower, this is a formidable challenge. You need all your allies, big and small, European on European. Because this is what America has is more precious than anything else. So Secretary General Stoltenberg, uh, in his already uh, uh, extended after extension <laughs> mandate, and uh, we are very proud to work with him and, and, and for him, he served with President Obama, President Trump, President Biden, and of course there are differences. Of course there are nuances. Of course it makes a difference. But by and all, I think there is a realization on both sides of the aisle in this great country of America that it's good to have allies, it's good to have friends. So yeah, there will be differences. In Europe, to answer the second part of the question, there's always be a natural question mark. Is it good to be over-dependent on one big ally? And sometimes there's also a political argument that is trying to use the pretext of so-called American, let's say, not always very, very linear uh, foreign policy uh, to advance some political subjects. Very so I think, I think we are pretty rock solid. Uh, America needs its European allies. We need America. And all of us need uh, all around the world friends and allies. That's bottom line. Tom, That's having it. completely spoiled your candidacy to become defense secretary, <laughs> I feel I owe it to you to have the last word. You want to put one more thing on, on here? Look, the, the, the last thing I was going to say is the major strategic challenges we're facing are, of course, Russia and Europe, China in different ways around the world, and Iran operating as a terrorist state attempting to murder people in the UK and sadly here too. And staying strong on all three of these is incredibly important. But one of the things that is absolutely striking about the relationship that they have with others and we have between ourselves is they have no allies. They occasionally brutalize other nations into supporting them. They occasionally bribe other nations into supporting them. The United States, the United Kingdom, all other NATO partners have partners who are willing to go with them because they know it's the right thing to do. That is an amazing position of strength. And that's why this alliance means so much more than others. On that optimistic note, shall we wrap up? Please, a round of applause for my panel here. <laughs> really terrific.